Yes. Oh, there you go. Good evening. I would like to welcome you to our Good Friday Eve, our Good Friday service this evening. And the call to worship this evening comes from Book of Isaiah, chapter 53. It is quite long, but I believe that it is very fitting for our service this evening. So please follow along with me. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible under the pew. You could take it out, or I think it's on the screen as well. Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, and a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteem him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he has pierced for our transgression he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chitestment that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep has gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own ways. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is laid to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grief with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had not no, he had, <clears throat> Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet he was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge, shall the righteous one, my servant, make many a, to be acquainted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressor, yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Let us bow our heads as we give this evening to the Lord. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this word that was that we just read together in Isaiah 53. Lord, it was a clear testimony and it was a clear prophecy of the ways that you will send your son Jesus Christ to come and to die for the transgression of us. And Lord, as we are here this evening, let us draw near to you as we place our sins and as our place ourselves before you lord that you will do your business in our hearts as we go through this service lord as we pray this evening may you reveal yourself to us clearly through your through the cross the work that has been done so we praise you for this evening and we worship you in jesus name i pray Everybody to rise and let's sing a few songs together to the Lord.
a reading by T.S. Eliot. The wounded surgeon plies the steel that questions the distempered part. Beneath the bleeding hands we feel the sharp compassion of the healer's art. Resolving the enigma of the fever chart, our only health is the disease. If we obey the dying nurse whose constant care is not to please, but to remind of our and Adam's curse, and that to be restored, our sickness must grow worse. The dripping blood, only our drink. The bloody flesh, our only food. In spite of which, we like to think that we are sound, substantial flesh and blood. Again, in spite of that, we call this Friday good. met before. Uh, glad to have you with us and want to remind you of a couple of things. One is if you uh, would, if you are new to North Shore, we'd love for you to fill out one of our connect cards that are in the pew in front of you. We also have uh, the ability to text connect to the number on the screen and that'll allow you just to learn more about our church, give you a chance to hear about things before uh, they happen and, uh, and also just to learn more about North Shore. So we'd, we'd love to remind you to do that and also want to remind you that uh, Easter in just a couple days, Resurrection Sunday, we'll have an opportunity to worship together at our normal times and we'd love for you to invite friends, uh, people who tend to pay attention maybe around this time of year. Uh, we are so excited to be able to talk more, even more passionately, enthusiastically about the resurrection of Jesus Christ to people who often uh, only have a chance to really hear about it once a year. So very excited about that and hope that you'll bring friends, neighbors, uh, and others with you. So tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to talk briefly, we're going to hear about the cross in particular. And you know probably many of the events, the surrounding things that happen is Jesus is led uh, to his death on the cross. But tonight, what we're going to focus on is what actually happens in that moment that matters so deeply for us as human beings. In the Gospel of Luke, there's a part of the, resurre or the uh, crucifixion story that you may not be familiar with, which is Jesus is walking along a pathway to his place of death. Pilate, uh, the governor, has just signed his death warrant and he's heading out to be killed by Roman executioners. And there are people along the pathway, including some women who are deeply grieving. And the, the original languages have this sense that we might not catch in the English, which is that they were suffering with him, but not just suffering with him, they were punishing themselves as they walked alongside Jesus. Now, I mention that because Jesus stops them and he comforts them. And he warns them. It's important to Jesus to make sure they know that it is not for them to pay the penalty, to pay the pain of the cross. I mention that because for many of us who are here tonight, or people you may know, you may have grown up in a tradition where the idea is if you can just make yourself feel some of what Jesus felt. If you can just make yourself feel enough pain, then maybe somehow God will turn and be gracious to you. It may be that that's the way in which you've interacted with the cross before. And so it may be a little disturbing for you to not do that tonight. Because what I want to do is I want to say this, that you really only have two ways to view the cross it's either going to be, and this doesn't matter, Christian or non-Christian, everybody has to decide. Either the cross is going to be an invitation to guilt, 
4 is a monument to the love of God for sinners. It can only be an invitation to guilt or a monument of the love of God for sinners. Tonight we're going to follow two stories in this sermon. The first is Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah. And the second, of course, is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ 2,000 years later. First, let me take you to Genesis 22. This is a story you may have heard before, but maybe we can think about it a little bit differently tonight. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and he arose and he went to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. He took his hand, in his hand, the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together, and Isaac said to his father Abraham, my father. He said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. Now when they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the, the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid on him the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Let me pray. Lord God, we ask that tonight you would help us again to look upon your cross and to see not an invitation to guilt, but a monument to the love of God for sinners. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would turn our hearts toward you, that we might see you and believe. We ask in Christ's name, amen. So you might be wondering why this is in the Bible. The gods of the land in Israel's time were well-known child killers. The child sacrifice cult of Molech, one of the reasons why God brings his people into the land, to eradicate it. The Hebrew word that's used here for offering in Abraham, that word is shahat. It's a, a word used by the Bible elsewhere to refer to the pagan worship of false gods. The entire event from beginning to end is meant to mimic the false worship that plagued the land. The entire event was meant for God to dramatically re-enliven this false worship so that he could expose it for the falsehood that it is. Now, it's easy in our moment to challenge a child sacrifice cult. We think who'd be attracted to that sort of deity, who would do this kind of thing. But the cult of Molech was about the belief that if you give what is most precious to you to the fires of your own ambition, if you sacrifice everything, in order to be successful, to be beloved, to be respected, if you're willing to give every last precious thing to the fire alarm of your, I'm just kidding. If you're willing to give every last bit, everything to your own pursuits, maybe you can make it. And in the end, there's very little difference between the fires of Molech and freezing out your own children 
over years and decades of pursuing your own career or hobbies as the most important thing to you. For all of us, there are no new kinds of people. The same kinds of people that were a part of Molech worship are the same kinds of people that show up in churches. Same kinds of people. Why does God give us this picture? He wants us to see, to lovingly make clear to the one person who would be the leader of his people forever and would lead them to one day find a Messiah, the Christ, he wanted to make it very clear to that patriarch of promise, to Abraham, he wanted to make it very clear to the one who would be the line of Christ that he intends to answer with finality one very important question. It is the very important question that you and I have to answer even now, even tonight, as we look at Jesus, as we think about his cross. It's a very important question, and the question is this. Can the power of our own sacrifices save us in the end? The Bible says no. So from the time of Abraham and Isaac until the time of Jesus, it was clear that God was not going to allow our own blood to save us, whether our children or ourselves. Now, that's the first sacrifice. What about the second? The death of Jesus Christ. It deals with this question of how we're going to be saved. If we're not going to be saved by our own blood or our own sweat, how are we going to be saved? Take you to John 19. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him. And with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and he put it on the cross and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. The very first evangelism of the Christian faith, right? So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather the man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. And after this, Jesus, knowing all that, that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. And a jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Bowed his head, gave up his spirit. Now Jesus is led away bearing his own sacrificial wood like Isaac. The knife stopped for Father Abraham but not God the Father. In the near death of Isaac, here's what we learn. We learn that there's nothing we can give to make ourselves right with God. In the actual death of Jesus, we learn that there's nothing God won't give to make us right with him. It is not an implement of guilt, but a monument the love of God. The tzaddiks are uh, a modern purity cult that's descended from uh, Hebrew, uh, a Hebrew lineage, and their name means the righteous. They grew out of a movement that believed that the Pharisaical way of living, you know the Pharisees, if you know anything about the scriptures, the Pharisees were the ones who, who always seemed to have the outer life of righteousness. And the Sadiqs believed that the Pharisees weren't living righteous enough lives. That their keeping of moral laws, it was enough to, it wasn't quite enough to assure a person of eternal life. Even the rigorously holy were not holy enough. So that Sadiqs, what they did was they started a tradition where when a person died who was a righteous man, they would take his body and they would abuse it after his death, before he was buried. They would do things to simulate him being ritually stoned or hung or other awful things. 
And the idea was, because a man wasn't dead until he was buried in this culture, by punishing the body once he had died, it was a way to gain some more credits before all the accounting was due. It was a way to try to wring out of our bodies one more way to make ourselves holy. The tzaddiks realized that there wasn't enough self-punishment in one life to make yourself right with God, so they punished their corpses. We have a tradition at North Shore that on Good Friday, we pin our sins to the cross. And you might wonder why we do this. Uh, it's actually a practice of setting aside our own self-punishments, our own good works, our own righteousness for a moment. And saying, when I come to the cross, all I can give is my sin. It's our way of Telling that truth about the cross, what is it? Is it guilt for us? Or is it love from God? We have to be confronted with that tonight. You'll, you'll have a chance to practice that together as a people in a moment when we come forward through the center aisle and you'll take that thing and you'll, you'll pin it to the cross. But all of us have to figure out how we're going to encounter the cross this evening. In the Bible, there are all kinds of people who have to figure out how they're going to encounter Jesus, how they're going to encounter his cross. The Pharisees, what did they bring as they came to the cross? They brought their spotless religious lives, the tax collectors. They brought their, their cunning and skill, their political connections. The Nathaniel brings his cynicism about anything good coming out of Nazareth. And the Sadducees bring their religious sophistication and their realism. And uh, the Roman executioner, Brings his soldier's pension and, and maybe the little idol that his son carved that he kept in his pocket. You know, it's just a job. The surgeon, the school teacher, the stay-at-home parent, the ticket taker on the green line, the, the line cook at the Massapequa Diner. At least once a year, everybody, everyone has to contend with Good Friday. Because in our culture, in our world, it, it's still a thing. The residue of it still exists to where every person who hears about it knows that in general there's someone who was crucified there and you have to decide what you're going to do about that. You have to think about it. You have to be affected by it. All of us will have to bring something to the cross, either sitting in a church or very intentionally not sitting at a church, sitting at home, sitting at a bar, sitting somewhere else. And when you come to the cross, if you belong to Jesus... You have to be confronted by this fact. I cannot save myself. You can either pin your qualifications, references, your good works, or your sin. Only one of those leads to life. If tonight, if tonight we learn this, that it's not our devotion to God that saves us. If you learn tonight, maybe for the first time, that it is not about your technique in living the Christian life that saves you, then there's something very important that's possible. What's possible is that Jesus could no longer be your client who provides for you a good that you have earned. And you no longer become an accounts payable or an accounts receivable to Jesus. Instead, the cross because you have nothing in you in this life or even your corpse after you're dead that can make you right with God, you might have the opportunity finally to see the cross for what it is. Not guilt. Not your guilt. But the love of God for sinners. That you might be freed finally to see I am not in a transactional relationship with God but in a love relationship with the Savior and the King of Kings, whose death no longer means that I have to make myself feel bad enough to merit his death. You can't do that. Instead, you might look at his death and say, he loves me. I give him my sin. He takes it. For years, uh, Bill Edgar's full-time job was to show up at funerals. And he would interrupt the eulogies. 
in order to speak one last word from the dead. They paid him to do this. All kinds of things he would share. He would share things like the fact that their children were receiving nothing in the will, or their spouse was a cheater, or they didn't do or did do the things they said they did or didn't do. They wanted to have the last word. Bill did this. It was his full-time job. He did this, traveling the country because he believed that the dead deserved one last say. Now, I want you to think about what would happen if we were to hold a eulogy tonight for the Jesus who died on the cross. And that as the eulogy was happening, Bill Edgar, wherever he is, stood up in the congregation and said, what about you? What would be Jesus' word? What would be his parting shot, his final statement? If he talked about you, what would be the last thing that he could say? What would be the thing he'd want you to hear? Maybe you're squirming about that. Maybe you think what he would say is, do better. Be better. Be stronger. Parent your children better. Find a Christian spouse. I'm disappointed that you're not married. Get a better job. Give more. Live like a better Christian. Maybe that's what you think. I think, first of all, I think he'd call us by name. He'd say, Sue, Bill, Paul, Jang, James. He'd call us by name. And then I think he'd say to us, all the, the hustlers, the self-starters, the ones who work hard, the perfectionists, and the procrastinators. I think he'd say something really important to us. I think he'd say one thing that we maybe weren't ready to hear. I think he'd say the most important thing. I think he'd say this. I think he'd say, it's finished. I think he'd say it's finished. Because there's not a single one of us that doesn't struggle with that idea. That everything that must be done in order to save us from our sins as we turn in faith to Christ has been done. And there is nothing that you can add to it. And if you belong to Jesus, you can be nothing more or nothing less than God's own beloved son or God's own beloved daughter. And I know that because the cross tells us so. Romans 8, 1 through 4 says this. There is, there, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There is no condemnation for those of you who placed your faith in Jesus Christ, who have come to him and said, Jesus, I give you my sin. I need your forgiveness. I am lost, trying to make myself saved. I need you to be in my life to transform me and to draw me close. I need your blood to cover me. That person, for that person, it is finished. It's done. Some of you are dying tonight because of what you've done or left undone. There's not enough time before you die or after to make it right. So I want to encourage you to do this. Let go of the knife. Grab hold of Jesus. He'll do the dying. Tonight, we turn our eyes again to see that the ram is in the thicket. God says, not your blood, but mine. Let's go to him in prayer.
Lord Jesus, help us, your people, to see the cross not as an implement, an invitation to guilt, not a thing we can earn, but that it would be a monument of your love for us, that it would stand in the way when we seek to save ourselves. When we are crushed by our failures, would it tell us that we are your own beloved sons and daughters? When we are tempted by pride to elevate ourselves, would it anchor us in your forgiveness and love for us? God, would you tonight again stand in our way and remind us the love of God which makes us the forgiven of God and the beloved of God and the commissioned of God and the healed of God and the renewed and transformed of God. Remind us, Lord Jesus, that we might live in the freedom of your children. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Well, we are going to take an opportunity as we move to this time in our service where we bring our sins to the cross and rehearse that. Uh, Roz is going to lead us in a confession as we do every week on Sundays and I'll extend the pardon of Christ to you and then we'll come forward to lay our sins where they belong. At the sixth hour of the day, <clears throat> which in the Hebrew system would have meant noon. They counted from sunrise or approximately 6 a.m. Darkness covered the world. It's important to understand what's going on here. That darkness is an indicator of the son's estrangement from the father and the spirit as he paid the penalty of our sin. And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your cease into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will wring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the mourning for, on, not for only sun and the end of it like a better bitter day. We confess that our sin darkened the darkness. Our sin made you forsaken on the cross. Our sin was the cause of the Father's mourning. Our sin was the cause of the Spirit's absence. We confess it was our sin that put you there but your love that held you there. May we, by confession and forgiveness, purchased through the blood of Christ, enter into the freedom of the children of God. Confess your sin silently before the Lord. Friends, I want you to hear these words from 1 John on the screen. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, friends, you can lift your heads, and I'd ask you to stand as you're able where you are. And receive from God his pardon. For those of you who have confessed your sin by faith, you are not alone. You are not forsaken. You are not given up on. 
You are not done. You are in Christ. Therefore, by the blood of the Son, you are forgiven and healed and welcomed home. And together we say, Alleluia, Amen, and Amen. In the celebration of the peace we've received from God, we extend it by coming to the cross together to leave our sins there as you would choose. So as you would come through the center aisle and then back through to have a seat, uh, you may do that now.
Just as I am, though tossed about, with many conflicts, many doubts, fightings within, and tears without, O oh, Lamb of God, I come, I come.
Well, friends, it's good for us to rehearse, to remember, and also to recognize that just as quickly as we say Christ is crucified, we also have to be willing to say the next thing, right? We know we'll celebrate in fullness on Sunday, and then I uh, want you just to hear this doxology from the book of Jude, which says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. Now, friends, the great evangelist Kurt Presley once said, when death took on Jesus of Nazareth, he took on too much. Let's get ready to celebrate on Sunday. We hope to see you then. Have a good night.